Hey, welcome back to the Way Cool uh, Cooking School. My name is Chef Mary, and we are super, super excited to be back live to show our show me the dough cooking lesson today. Today is all about yeast doughs and what you can do with one simple dough to make three very, very cool different projects. Today we are going to be making cinnamon rolls, pizza, and pretzel bites, all using the same type of dough. And we're gonna turn it into different things using different techniques on how we bake them and how we shape them and how we prepare the dough today. So we're gonna walk you through how to make dough from scratch. We're gonna walk you through how dough works. And then we're gonna show you these really, really cool projects. Before we do that, I wanna introduce again, Lynn Elliott, who's the owner of the Way Cool Cooking School. And um, if you are watching live today and you've purchased one of the Show Me The Dough um, meal kits to go that we have been offering, um, she's got a little quick note for you before we get started. So here's Lynn. Hi everybody, so glad to have you here with us again today. Um, we are going to be introducing the new meal kit, which will be available for you to pick up next Tuesday um, and we're calling it the rock and ramen bowl um, and with that there is all the ingredients to make two different recipes um, with ramen and a very cute um, cupcake that looks like a bowl of ramen so we'll show you the um, ingredients after we get done with the video but just wanted to throw it out there that we do have one more kit that we are going to be doing um, next week and we want you to all put in orders over the weekend and we'll have those ready for you on Tuesday. Um, and as far as, um, you know, the new stay at home thing going on, uh, we are going to be making the kits here, but these are really takeout meals for you and your family. So uh, we will bring them out curbside again for you. You can just drive up and pick them up just like you're at a takeout restaurant. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Mary and we'll let you learn all about yeast dough. Thanks. Hi, okay, we're back. So the first thing I'm gonna do after I wash my hands is I'm gonna roll up my sleeves um, because we are probably gonna get a little flowery here today. Uh, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna show you guys how to make our Way Cool signature dough. We use this dough here at the Way Cool Cooking School to make close to a quarter of a million personal pizzas every year at the Way Cool Cooking School. It's one of the recipes that we are most proud of and I can't wait to share it with you. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create and we're gonna create a well. And so the well method of making flour from scratch is basically you're gonna create a mound of flour and we're gonna do it inside of this bowl. And then we're gonna dig a well out to put our wet ingredients into. And so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab three cups of flour. This is a one-time batch of dough, and this is enough dough to make one large 14-inch round pizza or eight to 10 personal individual pizzas. For those of you who are baking along with us at home, your kit is gonna get divided into three different parts so we can make all three projects today. And that's what I'm gonna do here today too. All right, so I'm gonna dump in my flour. And like I said, I wanna create a little well with this. And so I'm gonna take my big wooden spoon. I love wooden spoons. There's something about them that like, they just feel like they have more soul in the kitchen. Um, but it's perfect for this job because it doesn't have any holes or grates. The dough's not gonna get stuck in between in the spoon. So grab a big, nice spoon, and I'm gonna dig a well in the center of this flour, big enough here to hold the liquid ingredients. Now, my liquid ingredients that are gonna make this work is I'm gonna use one cup of hot water. So the water needs to be about 120 degrees. And without breaking out a thermometer every time that you wanna make pizza, what does that temperature even feel like? And what it is, is if you run your kitchen tap hot enough or like you stick your finger in and you're like, ooh, that's hot. Like a little too hot to wash your hands with, um, then that's hot enough for making the dough today. If it's too cold, the yeast takes a really, really long time to work. And if it's too hot, if you boil it or heat it up in the microwave, you can actually kill the yeast and then it won't rise at all. And so um, Lynn is running some hot water for me right now. So I'm gonna just pass that to her and she's gonna grab that. I put one cup on that. One cup. And then what we're gonna do to that warm water is we're gonna take, I'm gonna move my flour off to the side so you guys can see what's going on. Is we're gonna take and we are going to activate the yeast. So we're using an instant dry yeast that looks like little sands. It looks like just like little sands or little baby seeds. And what we're gonna do is I'm gonna stir that into our warm water and it's going to kind of get mucky and dissolve a little bit. I always kind of think it looks like one of those instant cappuccinos. It does not smell like an instant cappuccino though. It has a very kind of wet, soggy bread smell and that's how you know it's working. 
All right, so we're gonna take, and I'm gonna stir that up just a little bit. Now, yeast needs sugar to do what it needs to do, and that's make carbon dioxide so it works in our dough when our dough rises. And so we're gonna feed it a little sugar. And it eats all kinds of sugar. It eats granulated sugar, brown sugar. We like to use honey. And this is kind of one of our wonderful tricks here when we make dough at the Way Cool Cooking School, is we like to use honey in our dough. Now some people in their kits have the little packets and other people have like the souffle cups oh. that have honey in it. So um, you, your kit would have it in one way or One way or the other. Yeah, you add the honey if you're, if you're making the dough with us here. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just stir this up and I want it to get foamy on top. So here is what's happening. It's like the magic of bread, which makes bread and baking so, so super cool. If you can imagine, the little yeast are basically gobbling up the sugar. They're taking the sugar and they're turning it into bubbles of carbon dioxide. And they're releasing that into the water. And that's what the white foamy part you see on top of your foam is. And so you can kind of see, it does not take very long and you already have like little white foamies that are starting up on the top. And this kind of like, the science of turning sugar into carbon dioxide. When you mix it with our flour, which you're gonna see here in a little bit, is what allows the dough to like keep making air bubbles and the dough to rise. And it's just like super fascinating to me. It's like the wizardry of baking is the heart of the yeast and how the yeast works. And yeast can be made like a bunch of different ways. You can actually even like, that's how they make wine. That's how they make like sarsaparilla. That's how you make a whole bunch of different kinds of breads. Um, very, very cool. And there's different ways that you can do this too. Um, but we are gonna use that dry active. There's also something called like wet yeast, which comes in a big block and it looks like clay and you can cut it off and stick it into what you're making too. So there's a bunch of different things that are available um, if you can't find the little pouches of the dry active yeast at the grocery store. So we've got that and I'm kind of talking so I can allow that to get a little bit foamier here with what's going on. And then I'm gonna go back to my well of flour and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna dump, now that I can see the white foamies on top, I know that it's working. And you can actually take and it, it will grow and you'll get like maybe like an inch of foam on top of your yeast and that's kind of where it's like ideal. Um, and that takes about five minutes. We're gonna skip that step. Um, and so if you wanna make this at home and kind of let that go a little bit, it's also really kind of cool and is a great science experiment to kind of estimate and guess how tall your yeast is gonna grow in your cup when you mix it all together too. So one cup of water, um, we've got our tablespoon of honey and our yeast in there. And the yeast is if you're buying it in bulk, cause you can find it in bulk too at like Sam's Club in those places, it's two and a half teaspoons of yeast that we're gonna put in there. I'm gonna pour that into the well right there. And then I'm also going to add some olive oil and I'm gonna pour that in there too. Now, these kits also have salt and the salt is going to be a dry ingredient and so we wanna kind of incorporate that into the flour and gradually incorporate it into the yeast. Because we're making this so fast and we're not gonna like let it just hang out with the yeast, it's not gonna damage it that we're adding it in all together. If you are like, uh, you don't ever wanna let salt sit and hang out in your liquids with the yeast because salt can also kill the yeast and make it not effective. So I'm gonna take my salt and I'm gonna sprinkle that along, along the edge of my flour so that can be incorporated in really, really easily. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my wooden spoon and I'm gonna to start to stir the inside of this bowl. And what I, my goal here is, is to gradually let that flour kind of start creating a a shaggy blob of dough around my spoon. And so I'm gonna keep stirring it up here and it's gonna to turn to kind of like a very wet, mucky mud stage first, there. It looks like if you are a pottery person, it kind of looks like slip that you would make pottery with. And then as you kind of incorporate more and more of the flour, I'm spinning the bowl as I'm stirring here, is it's gonna to start to kind of act as like one big homogenous mass around my spoon. And when it gets to that point, which is kind of right now, it's kind of getting like little shaggy trails on, around the edges. That's when I'm gonna take my spoon out of the dough and I'm gonna put my fingers to use. I get asked all the time, Mary, what is your favorite cooking tool? And although like wooden spoons are great and spoonchulas are awesome, this is my favorite cooking tool because I always have them with me and they can do so many cool different things. Um, cooking is one of the very few things in the world that you get to use all five senses at one time. 
And I think that that's what makes it cooking so very, very special. Um, and so what I'm gonna do now is that you can see I'm kind of folding the dough over on itself while I'm spinning the bowl to incorporate the flour into the dough ball in the middle here. That's gonna continue to grow and kind of suck up the extra flour that is in the bowl as I'm pressing it down into it. Once I get the dough to a point where it's kind of like this, it's a little, like you can see it's shaggy. This is actually called the shaggy stage of dough. I am then gonna take and I'm gonna start kneading it with the heel of my hand. So I'm gonna fold it over in half and press kind of away from me and start turning it this way. And this is gonna incorporate even a little bit more of the flour. And just like when you're making pasta dough or a lot of doughs by hand, you may not use all of the flour. And the reason why is because it sometimes it depends on the humidity in the air. If it is really, really humid out, like it is in Minnesota in August, you might actually have to add a little bit more flour to make your dough ball. Because it is kind of dry in here though, I don't think that we're gonna incorporate all of this in. Now, the hack for this. If you have a KitchenAid mixer in your home, you can do all of this in your mixer at home. You would just put your wet ingredients in the bottom of your mixing bowl, and then dump the flour and salt on top with your dough hook, and then press go. And it really only takes to like the low setting and probably about three minutes, and then you can do that that way. All right. This is a good way to get exercise in your house here too. Switch arms so that you're alternating. All right. Mary, I have um, some people asking about um, that they either can't find the oil or didn't have oil, and they're wondering if the, the dough will still work without the oil. The dough will still work without the oil. If your dough is, is looking kind of dry and you don't have um, olive oil at home, this is a great question. You can use a little bit of vegetable oil in your dough as well. If you have vegetable oil at home instead of the olive oil, or you can take um, and just add a little bit of um, a little bit more water if the dough doesn't have the water in it. Um, the olive oil adds a little bit of fat and flavor to the dough, um, but it doesn't stop it from being dough. So that's a great question. Yeah, I thought so. Okay, so I'm gonna take and I'm gonna, this is kind of mucky flour that's kind of like sketchy and shaggy. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get rid of that bowl. We do not need that bowl. And I'm gonna take and on a lightly floured surface, so I'm just gonna take a little bit of my flour here and sprinkle that. I'm gonna start kneading it on the counter. Now what we're doing right now by kneading the dough is we're actually creating the structure of the dough. The more you knead the dough, the more you're creating gluten strands within the dough that are gonna cause it to be an elastic dough. So as you're watching this, you'll notice like it's getting smoother and also it's getting a little bit more like, like a rubber ball or a stress ball. You know you're done when it is smooth on top like this, and it has the texture of like a memory foam pillow. So you can press into the dough just like that and it'll kind of bounce back. If you over knead the dough, it's gonna be bouncy like a stress ball and that's okay, don't panic. Be fearless in the kitchen and know that 90% of the time there's a solution for everything that happens in the kitchen. And the solution for over kneaded dough is to let that dough rest and get nice and soft so that it's not too elastic. Because if it is, the, the little gluten strands are so tight. Imagine like little paper chains that the more you knead them, the tighter those paper chains get. And if you don't let them relax, it's very hard to knead out into the projects. But you don't need to start over. Just let it chill. Just let it chill for like 15 minutes and you're fine and you're right back on track. All right, so we've got our dough ball here. Once your dough is made, this dough needs to rise. And so we want the dough to get about two times its size and we would place that into a oil bowl and let that happen. And that takes, um, you want it to be kind of in a warm place. Uh, we take plastic wrap and wrap the tops of our bowls with it and let it sit in kind of just our kitchen because our kitchen has usually got stuff going on. Um, uh, a trick is always like, you just put it on top of the refrigerator because the fan from the refrigerator would help it proof a little bit faster. If you do not have plastic wrap, you just take a damp, warm towel, lay it over your bowl, and let that rise for about 60 minutes. It takes about an hour to double in size. And magic of TV, ta-da! We have a full bowl of dough. This is the dough that we're gonna use for all three of our cooking projects today. So as you can see, it is very, it's got like little Swiss bubbles, like Swiss cheese kind of in it, or like a moon crater, and it's filled up our entire bowl. So and from this size to that size, that's what you're looking for. All right, I'm going to take the lid off or the plastic wrap off, throw that away, get that out of here. And now I'm going to do something and this stage is called punching down the dough. 
So that yeast has created enough carbon dioxide to make the dough rise, but we don't need all of that gas in there. So punching down the dough is really, really fun for little fists of fury. Take out some of your anxiety that you may be having because you literally punch the dough. It's awesome. So I'm gonna take and I'm just gonna punch down the dough here and get all of that extra air out of the dough. And then I'm gonna take and I'm gonna take this dough and flip it onto the counter. Now, because we're doing three projects today with this dough, my first job is gonna be to divide this into thirds. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of roll it <clears throat> into a nice big log here. And I'm gonna take my bench cutter. And this is not sharp, it's just a, it's a cool tool um, to grab for your kitchen. If you have one, this is what they're used for, for cutting soft things like dough. If you don't have one, of course you can use a knife. That's completely fine. Um, and you can cut that as well too. So I'm gonna take and I'm gonna divide this dough into thirds. And I'm eyeballing this, people. You do not need to weigh it out. You can weigh it out if you wanted to, and so they would weigh all the same um, for these three projects. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take, kind of a, roll them into little balls. And how I do this is I take the dough and I wrap it over my fingertips, and I kind of tuck in the ends here like this, and then I just kind of shape it. And these dough balls, if you divide them into thirds, should be about the size of a baseball. Um, a little bit larger or a softball. All right, so I'm gonna take and I'm gonna do that and I'm gonna just set those three right up in front here so you guys can see what's going on. And so the first thing we're gonna do is I think we're gonna make our cinnamon rolls because they're gonna take the longest to bake in the oven. And so if you want all of these projects to come out at the same time so you can have pizza and pretzel bites and then cinnamon rolls for dessert, it's a carb lover's dream, I love it. <laughs> um, then we're gonna do the cinnamon rolls first so they can bake in the oven. So I'm gonna take one third of the dough and I'm going to start to press it out. Now, instead of just pulling the dough, remember those gluten strands we talked about? If you pull the dough, it's like pulling a rubber band. When you let go, it's gonna snap and it's gonna get small again. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do something called docking. Docking the dough is a measure where you press the dough out and you kind of break up those gluten strands gently. And I'm gonna start in the middle of the dough here and I'm gonna kind of press it out to make it look like a rectangle. All right. So we've got our dough and then I'm gonna pick it up and flip it over on here as well. And I want this third of the dough to be a rectangle. And if you are a measuring type person, I would say that this dough is probably like seven inches by nine inches. It's kind of the size of the dough here that we're working with today. Um, and if you're not a measuring person, it's about this big. All right, so we're gonna pop it down on there. Now this is nice olive oil dough, which is really, really great for your cuticles by the way. Little, little spa bonus there for you. Um, and so I don't have a lot of flour underneath. If your dough is oily like this one and you put flour on your countertop, on an oily countertop, you are gonna get like goopy olive oil flour. And so what you can do is actually wipe off your counter with just a paper towel and then lightly flour it and make sure you're doing it that way. For what we're doing for this, it'll totally be okay. All right, cinnamon rolls. In the kits, you got a little bit of butter, you got some cinnamon and sugar, and you got some glaze. Um, and so you have everything in your kit to make these cinnamon rolls now that you have the dough made. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna melt this butter. And I have it in just a little microwave safe bowl and we're gonna melt this for 30 seconds in the microwave. And so I'm gonna take and we're gonna do that. And then you also have a package of pre-made cinnamon and sugar. If you wanna make these at home and you've got a cool dough recipe or you want our dough recipe, um, our dough recipe is actually on our Way Cool Cooking School blog under recipes. You can find this dough recipe also. The measurements for this um, are two tablespoons of sugar and one teaspoon of cinnamon is the ratio of the cinnamon and sugar that we use. Um, you can adjust it however you want. If you like a gooier cinnamon roll, you can um, actually take and incorporate brown sugar into this too. And because brown sugar has molasses in it, you're gonna get a gooier, more caramely type cinnamon roll. So that's kind of a fun little bonus add-on if you like a gooier roll. So what I've got is a pastry brush now. I'm gonna take our melted butter and I'm just gonna take and I'm gonna paint it all over the tops of this. All right, if you do not have a pastry brush, you can just pour a little and grab a paper towel and just kind of smear that all over the top too. This is not needed. It's just a fun tool if you have one um, and paint it on there. All right. So we've got that there. Always when you're using any kind of stove or microwave or oven, to my little chefs out there, use your grown-ups, put them to work, make them do the hard stuff. 
Use your grown-ups always to turn and help you with the stove, with the microwave, or with the oven. We don't want any burnt fingers when we want just cinnamon rolls. All right, so I'm gonna take, and I, I'm saying this now because this is a little tiny bit warm here. We've got our butter laid out on here, and then I'm gonna open up my package of cinnamon and sugar, or your bowl of cinnamon and sugar here. Maybe, now I have buttery fingers. You want me to help? Always oh, have a kitchen yeah. scissors. That's the problem. There we go. So I'm gonna take, and I'm just going to liberally sprinkle all of this over the tops of here. All right, I'm sprinkling, I'm sprinkling, I'm sprinkling. And this is kind of a cool project. Just like most cooking projects in the kitchen, there is generally a job for every age group. I would say, although you might find some of the cinnamon and sugar in their mouths, this is a project for two to five year olds for sure. Um, they can be the cinnamon and sugar inspectors and sprinkle all the cinnamon and sugar on. Okay, I'm covering the whole top. Again, the upgrades for this, if you like a gooier roll, is add a little brown sugar to this. Um, I also love to add ground cardamom and nutmeg to mine, so it has that little extra oomph of flavor. Um, those are two of my very favorite baking ingredients there too. You could also add lemon zest in there or orange zest. Orange and cinnamon would be really, really, really good. Um, at like the holiday time, you could add your pumpkin pie spice in here and make pumpkin pie spice cinnamon rolls. So there's lots of different variations that you can play with with this dough. All right, I'm gonna take and we're gonna start rolling up our cinnamon rolls. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start from the side closest to me and it's laid out the long way and I'm gonna roll it away from me and we're gonna roll it up into a log of cinnamon and sugar goodness. And it doesn't have to be that tight for what we're about to do. Cause then I'm gonna take the ends and I'm gonna scrunch them into a little thick log here. And again, remember this is one third of our dough and this is gonna make six individual cinnamon rolls with your kit. So you're gonna get six rolls out of this so everybody can have two rolls if you have like three people. Um, if you do the full batch of dough, this will make nine to 12 big old cinnamon rolls. Uh, with the roll. So depending on what size you like your cinnamon roll, I like them smaller because then I feel like I can eat more and that makes me happier. Um, all right, so I've got this. I'm gonna go back to my dough cutter and I'm gonna use it and I'm gonna divide it in half first. And then I'm gonna take and I'm gonna divide each half into thirds. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take each portion here and I'm gonna put it in my hand and I'm gonna turn it upwards so the cinnamon swirl is on top and kind of give it a little tap and I'm gonna set it into my oiled baking tin. So this is an eight by M, eight by eight brownie tin, um, uh, aluminum pan. If you have a real one, that works too. And I'm just gonna make sure that I put these in the pan and I put them about an, half of an inch to an inch away from each other so they got room to grow and hang out in there. All right, so we've got those tucked in. And we just put some Pam in the bottom of ours, but if you like a buttered dish, you can put butter in there too. Know that anything cinnamon and sugar that falls into the bottom of that pan is gonna turn into basically caramel when it comes out of the oven. All right, so we're gonna take this pan now and we're gonna bake it in the oven until the dough is cooked all the way through and the cinnamon and sugar has melted and the edges of each of these rolls are gonna be really beautifully golden brown. And, and so magic of TV, we're gonna put this this way and we're gonna go to the ovens Ta-da! Can you see the ovens? There they are. Oh, thank you, Lynn, for taking them out of the oven. Um, and we're gonna show you what the finished roll looks like right now. Okay, so we have got six golden brown cinnamon rolls fresh out of the oven here. And these have actually been cooling for probably about 10 minutes, which is why I can touch them. I'm not magic, that's not that hot. Um, and then to finish this project off, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your glaze, I'm gonna wipe the cinnamon and sugar off of my hands here really quick. You're gonna take your glaze and you're gonna smush it. And this is the glaze that came in the, pa the patches, the pouches um, and the kits. And so you're gonna use your fingers to get all a little smushy smushy, which is a way cool phrase. If you are a way cool fan, you've heard the word smushy smushy before, we all use it. Um, and what you're using is your body heat to warm this up. You do not want to microwave the glaze um, because the sugars and, and the fats will separate and then you end up with kind of like a greasy frosting. Uh, smushing is the best way to go. The recipe for this, this is a very simple glaze. It's just made up of a little bit of butter and powdered sugar and hot water. Um, you can also upgrade it and put some milk in your recipe as well. And so I'm gonna take and just snip the end off and then I'm gonna squeeze all of this down to the end that I snipped. 
and kind of hold it like a little piping bag and I'm gonna drizzle the icing over the tops of these cinnamon rolls. And you can then take and pop this whole tray back in the oven for like, um, like a minute, two minutes, and that icing will melt all over the tops of your cinnamon rolls. So we're gonna do that right now and we're gonna show you what that looks like. Okay, so I'm gonna take, and I'm gonna use my bench knife here for its other favorite job, and that is the kitchen bulldozer. And what it does is it bulldozes all of the gunk off of your countertop, so you are ready to do the next project. All right, so we've got that there. And so I'm gonna clean up a little bit of extra stuff here. And there's a lot of people tuning in, so I'm gonna say hi real quick between the next project. Hey to Chef Christine. Hey, Mickey Fetrell. McCurry in the house. I knew where was Mickey Fetrell. Hi, Mickey and kids. It's so good to see you guys all the way from Victoria tuning in. Um, my mom's watching. Hey, mom. Uh, hi to Chef Danica, who's watching. Hey, Chris, what's up? Stephanie, hi, how are you? Um, and let's see, we got Katie. Oh, awesome. Um, hi, Deb, how are you? Um, so cool to see all you guys on here. It's awesome. It's a great way to connect and see everybody. I love it so much. Um, the next project we're gonna do is we're gonna take and we're gonna make our pretzel bites. This is the project that's gonna take the second longest in the oven. So again, we're kind of doing things in backwards order here. So I'm gonna take the next third of dough and I'm gonna lay it out. And this time I am gonna flour my surface here with my flour shaker. If you do not have a flour shaker, use your fingers. And I'm gonna press it down and I'm gonna start by pressing this just like we did the other dough. Flip it over and press it again. And then this is where I'm going to break out my rolling pin. If you do not have a rolling pin, wine bottles work really, really great. Large glasses work really, really great, or tumblers. And the key to rolling out anything is not to use all of your Hulk power strength and push it away from you as hard as you can, because what that'll end up doing is making a very thick side of your dough and a very thin side of your dough. I like to start in the middle and like with little pinkies up, T fingers, just kind of wiggle it back and forth and then pick your dough up, flip it over so that it doesn't stick to your countertop and wiggle it again. And this time we're gonna, you don't really need to have a set shape, but we're gonna take and we're gonna make it kind of squarish in, in size here. So I'm gonna grab my, and put my rolling pin out of the way because we don't need that. Grab my bench cutter that I'm cleaning off here with a towel. And we're gonna cut this into like two by two inch squares approximately. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make 16 total squares. So here's for your math wizards out there, um, a little bit of fractions and a little bit of, of multiplication and division. How many cuts do I need to make into this dough to get 16 pieces? So I'm gonna cut it in half once I'm gonna cut it in half the other way. And then I'm gonna cut each of those in half and cut each of those in half again. And that is gonna give me a grid of four by four or 16 pieces. This is the true story. I was awful at math. I was awful at math in middle school and elementary school. It made me cry. Division was a very sad, sad thing for me. I was not good at math in high school. And I was really not good at math and algebra when I got to college until I got to culinary school. In culinary school, I had 120% in math classes and algebra because in my brain, this makes sense. And so for all of you who are maybe not math wizards out there, I highly encourage you to, to cook more because it might be the one connection that makes math a happy, happy thing for you. Because I can easily tell you like how many pies six pounds of butter makes but if someone was like, if you can take four ounces and divide that into 60, I would have no idea. I would have no idea. But with food, it makes sense. And so that's something that I love about cooking too at all different ages is that you can incorporate math and science into every different step that you're doing. And then you don't have to cry about algebra anymore. And you get to make cinnamon rolls and pretzel bites. And so that's a bonus too. All right. Back to our little sections here. I'm gonna take each of these sections and I'm gonna roll them into a little ball, like so. And we're gonna do that with every single one of these. And this is gonna be, a, you want it to be pretty, like a pretty tight little ball here. Because, and I like sometimes like to pinch the bottoms. If you've ever made dumplings, it's kind of the same technique as far as kind of like tucking the dough in to roll them into little balls. And these are gonna be our individual pretzel bites. So in your kit, because you guys are using the same amount of dough that I am, you should be able to get 16 little pretzel bites that are about the size, about an inch in diameter. 
there when we get those done. And what we're gonna do with these bites next is we're gonna take and we're going to put them into a hot tub. Now, the hot tub for pretzels and for pretzel bites is a, usually a baking soda bath. And so I have got a pot of water that's coming to a boil here next to me. And to that water, we are going to add some baking soda. And what the baking soda does is it what gives the pretzel the quintessential pretzel crust. So when we bake them, they get that nice pretzel crust on the outside and they stay gooey on the inside and soft on the inside. So we're gonna take, I've got like five more of these to quick roll up and then we're gonna add some baking soda to that water. Now, the first time I ever did this and added baking soda to boiling water, I thought for sure that I had done something wrong because it kind of bubbles up like a volcano. Don't panic, that's okay, but carefully add the baking soda. Don't just dump it all in all at once or it will boil all over your stove and then you have baking soda all over your stove. And so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna just turn the camera here really quick to, the, to our pot that we've got going on here so you can kind of see what's going on. And I'm gonna take and I'm gonna add this baking soda into the water. And we're gonna make a little swimming pool for it. So I'm gonna take and I'm just gonna start sprinkling it and it's bubbling up. So I'm gonna kind of do it a little slow just so that I know that I don't have it boiling over on the stove. And this is a two quart pan that I filled halfway up with water. So we've got that ready to go. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take and I'm gonna place these into the boiling water so they can be in a baking soda bath for about two minutes. Do not drop them from up here. That is like the number one thing. People get scared at the stove and are like, well, the farther my arm away is, the less I will burn. No, what happens is it splashes and then you have hot water everywhere. And so this is a great thing um, for your grown up to help you with is you take the, each little one and you just kind of place it on top of the boiling water and let it kind of go in one at a time. If you'd like to use some tongs, tongs are also a great way to prevent fingers from getting burnt. And so you just take your tongs and you drop those in like that. Um, and so that's a great way to, I'm reaching and I'm grabbing my little balls here. There we go, there we go. All of our little pretzel bites are going into their, their hot tub for a little swim to get their baking soda on. Now this, where the wooden spoon came in very handy before when we were making the project, we're gonna use a slotted spoon so that we can fish these out and put them onto our baking pan that we're gonna bake them on. And so what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna grab that pan and we're gonna let that hang out for a second. We got it, uh -huh. And when we're doing this, I've got the pan handy so I can go straight from the, the water to the pan. And so this pan has got parchment paper on it and it was just sprayed with some more Pam and you can oil it with whatever you wanna oil it with. You do wanna oil your pan with either olive oil or Pam, otherwise the pretzels will stick and you won't be able to get them off of the pan when they're done. All right, so the little dough balls have poofed in their little swimming pool that they were in their hot tub. And so that's how I know that they are ready to go on to the baking sheet. So I'm gonna just fish them out and set them on the pan. And then the next process of this is to give them even a more golden pretzel -y crust is we're gonna do something called an egg wash. And so the egg wash takes the protein in the egg and it actually, when it cooks, it creates that golden brown crust. There's other different kinds of washes that you can use. You could just use an olive oil wash and that would produce a nice darker color on your pretzel bites as well. Or if you want a really, really deep, deep brown, you can do like an egg and milk wash. And because there's a lot of fat and milk, the, the fat is actually gonna caramelize faster and create a really, really, really dark, dark thing. So we're gonna just use a plain egg wash. And so I've got that. I'm gonna turn my stove off now because I'm done with that project. I'm gonna move you guys back over here with me. Did you talk about spraying the pan? So yes, we definitely talked about spraying the pan. Ah! Panic. <laughs> okay, my tripod is not tripod in the way I'd like it to. Um, so any tech wizards out there, hey, side note, that has really, really great, uh, a tripod that you use for videos, send me an email or a message and let me know what that is. Cause this one is uh, okay, but not perfect. All right, our egg wash. I'm just gonna take one egg and I cracked it and I whisked it up with a fork and then I'm gonna use a pastry brush and I'm gonna just paint the tops of these and with our pastry brush here. Again, this is a project that if you do not have a pastry brush, you just put a little towel or a paper towel in there and then you can kind of dab it on top 
of the pretzel bites here too. Once I get them all painted, I'm gonna separate them a little bit so they're not sticking on top of each other. Although I'm sure if you are a Pinterest or a cooking fan, you've seen all sorts of cool different things. You can take and put these in a, like a wreath and they will all grow together so they're like pull apart pretzel bites. If you'd wanna do it that way, you could. We're gonna have individual pretzel bites for what we're doing today. All right, and then the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take and I'm gonna open up this salt and I'm gonna sprinkle salt all over the top. Now, because I moved these around and I had egg fingers, we all know that if you crack or open up eggs, the first thing you should do before you touch anything is wash your hands. And so I am going to leave our seasoning expert, Chef Lynn. Chef Lynn, I need your assistance. She's coming. And I'm gonna let her salt those and, and put them in the oven here um, so I can wash my hands and get the egg off of my fingers before we do the next project. Okay, all right. salt, salt it. All right, perfect. All right, so what this is is kosher salt. There is also um, pretzel salt that you, it's hard to find, and that's why I didn't include it in your kits, because um, I'm not sure you'd be able to have it for your home. But pretzel salt is actually bigger than the kosher salt is um, in here, so it's like a bigger granule on it. Uh, but the kosher salt is also got a nice, um, thick kind of texture to it, which works great for this. All right, so we didn't use all of it. We still got some left over, uh, but I've got that done. I'll pop that in the oven quick. All right, so those are gonna bake just like the cinnamon rolls, and my gosh, this is like live shows where you can smell the cinnamon rolls. I'm driving <laughs> me crazy. I love the smell of cinnamon rolls. Um, the upgrade for these pretzel bites is uh, if you have ever seen the everything bagel salt or have that seasoning, sprinkle some of that on top of them, and then you have like everything bagel pretzel bites, and it is fantastic. So, 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 so super good. One of my very favorite things to add on there. Um, Oh, hey, Jenny. Hey, Jenny, what's up? Really quick hi, shout out. And Jimmy. Hi, Jimmy. Jimmy, how much baking soda, Jimmy? Great question, I love the questions. Jimmy's gonna keep me on my toes the whole time, I love it. Um, so in your kit, I think it was what? A quarter of a cup? A quarter cup, cup. Yep. Fourth of a cup for two quarts of water. So you saw that two quart saucepan I had? You want a quarter of a cup um, of baking soda in that amount of water to let them go swimming around in. Cool question. Um, Bethy, Beth in the house. Hey, Beth, what's up? Carrie, hey, Carrie. Shout out to Carrie and her boys um, watching along too. Um, all right, Magic of TV number two. Pretzels went in. They will take way longer than this. I don't have commercial breaks, so this is what we've got going on. So you can see that all the pretzels are like golden brown, and they've got kind of a crunchy texture to the top of them. Super, super great. And then you'll notice like when we break them open, they're still bread doughy on the inside. And so that's like the favorite part about the, the pretzel bites is that they have that kind of crust and then the pretzel on the inside. So in the kits, there was a little bit of like what you can do for dipping sauces. Um, some of my favorite ones are uh, honey mustard sauce, which is just equal parts of honey and mustard stirred together and you have a honey mustard sauce. Nacho cheese sauce. Um, and there's a lot of different recipes for nacho cheese sauce on the internet that you can find um, as far as kind of making your own cheese sauce there. Uh, the other thing that I really, really like to dip these into is um, Mary's Fancy Spicy Asian Mustard Sauce. And basically what that is is mayonnaise, sriracha sauce, and like the spiciest brown mustard I can get my hands on. Um, and so it's, it's a really kind of cool combination and then that's really, really good for these too. You can make these sweet. You, they do not need to be savory. So after you get the egg wash done, if you had leftover cinnamon and sugar, you could sprinkle the cinnamon and sugar on top of these as well and then bake them off and then you could dip them into like icing. Super, super sweet, awesome like take on this whole thing. So you're getting two projects out of it. All right, we're gonna set those off to the side. Last but definitely not least is our way cool pizza. Um, this is one of those projects that I swear I could make with my eyes closed if I had to. Hopefully if there's ever like a chef challenge when they're like, what's your signature dish? I'm gonna be like personalized cheese pizzas. That's what's happening. All right, last ball of dough here. So we've got the last third of dough and I'm gonna take and I'm gonna roll it out into the log again and I'm gonna use my dough cutter and I'm gonna cut it into thirds to get three individual pizzas. So I've got that right there. I'm gonna take each of these and I'm gonna roll it into the baseball shape. And you can do this on the counter. You can do this in your hand. Um, you wanna just kinda of make sure that the smooth side of the dough is on top to start with and the wrinkly side is on the bottom when you do this. Same technique as before, we're gonna take and I'm gonna start docking the dough. And I'm gonna work in the middle, and then I'm gonna flip it over, and I'm gonna work my way to the outside edges. So one third of the dough is gonna make three 
about seven inch individual rounds. And they are, again, probably like a, between a sixteenth and a fourth of an inch thick as far as the dough is. So we're gonna take and we're gonna flap those down there. We're gonna do the same thing with the other one. And I always like to pretend that like you have a herd of kangaroos and you're bouncing on the dough with your kangaroos. I got that there. And this is really cool again, because this is kind of one of those things where like you're using so many of your senses at one time and pizza making for sure is like one of the most tactile and I love tactile cooking projects to get like your fingers and everything else involved. It's really, really awesome. Okay, so we've got our dough that's pressed out, ready to rock. Now we need to make our sauce. So I've just got this little baby bowl and I've got the ingredients to make my sauce and my sauce tower. So this is what came with your kit. You had a little cup of, one fourth of a cup of tomato sauce, plain tomato sauce, probably a tablespoon of tomato paste. We've got some sugar, we've got some Italian seasonings, and we've got about an eighth of a teaspoon of garlic. Um, if you are measuring this out for individual pizzas, this is a half of a teaspoon of Italian seasonings, and a half of a teaspoon of sugar is what goes in there. And they got three. And you got kits. three kits to make three of these individual pizzas in your kit. I'm just gonna do it the one time. Um, okay, so when you start making your sauce, every sauce needs a base. It's all about that base. And so the base for pizza sauce is tomato sauce. And so we're gonna take the lid off of our tomato sauce and it will maybe burp on you a little bit. So like take it off carefully so you don't get sauced all over the place. We're gonna take, we're gonna dump that into our little bowl. And so you can make these individually or you could dump them all and make them all at the same time too. All right, as you notice, tomato sauce is just that, it's tomato sauce. It's kind of juicy, um, it's pretty liquidy, and so it's too thin, we feel, to put on top of pizza. So we have to figure out a way to make it thicker. And so how we're gonna make the paste or the sauce thicker is with tomato paste. Tomato paste is awesome. It's like concentrated tomato goodness that acts as a thickener for soups and sauces and stews um, and actually adds like awesome flavor as well. So I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna take and I'm gonna plop that in there too. And so if it doesn't drop out, you can use a spoon and take it out that way. Um, I need a spoon. I use my spoon for something oh, else. Did. Let me grab you one. All right. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna do something called incorporating. So incorporating is when you take two separate ingredients and you push them together to make one new ingredient. This is another way that cooking is totally magic because after we do this, it can't be undone. It is a brand new thing. You're like a wizard in the kitchen. You can make a whole new thing. I love that part. All right, so I'm gonna take the back of my spoon and I'm just kind of stirring and smushing and incorporating the two items together. All right, so what we've got here is this thick sauce base now that we can put everything else into and because of this, it will not run all over the pizza when it heats up in the oven. If sauces are too uh, juicy, then the sauce goes all over your pizza crust and that's when you get the, bur the burnt parts on the edges of the crust and we don't wanna do that. All right, now tomatoes and tomatoes taste like tomatoes. That's exactly what this tastes like, tomatoes. And tomatoes, like lemons, limes, oranges, and Sour Patch Kids, all are a little bit sour and have a little bit of acidity to them. And so to balance out the acidity, we're gonna turn this and we're gonna add a little bit of sugar. And so what the sugar does is it's gonna take, and I'm just gonna be like, whoop, right in, um, is it balances out so that your tongue tastes the sugar before it tastes anything else. It's super, super cool. And we're gonna take, and so that way the sauce is not so sour, it's not so tart. If you do not, if you love a tart sauce, don't add as much sugar. There you go. Uh, this is really like super, super awesome kid-friendly sauce. As I said, like we make like a quarter of a million pizzas here a year. It's bonkers. Um, so we're gonna take and we're gonna put that in there. The next thing we're gonna do is now that it's got tomatoes and ketchup, you basically have, or I'm sorry, tomatoes and sugar, you basically have a bowl of ketchup. You do not wanna put ketchup on pizza. No, you do not. And so what we're gonna do now is we have to make it taste Italian. We have to make it taste like pizza sauce. And so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add some Italian seasonings to this. So I've got my little cup of Italian seasonings and yes, you could just dump them in, but to release all the little oils that are inside those leaves, we're gonna crush them. And those little oils that are trapped inside of those leaves are called flavonoids. And so the flavonoids are what are gonna actually give it like the essence of Italian seasoning. So I'm gonna take, and all I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna pour them on my fingertips over the bowl and I'm gonna use my thumb and I'm gonna to start to crush them so that they fall into the sauce. 
Now, if you were making, let's say, a eight hour sauce on the stove, crushing them would not be so necessary because you wouldn't have to release the oil so fast. But because we're gonna like make this, bake this, and eat it, hopefully, then we've got to release those oils so they go into your sauce. And so you can taste all of those yummy flavors. All right, I'm gonna take and I'm gonna stir them up and I'm burying the herbs inside of my sauce here and stirring them up so that they're all evenly incorporated into the sauce. You don't wanna bite into your sauce and just have like one bite of Italian seasonings. And I notice this is what happens because this is what happens to me all the time. The herbs are stuck on my spoon. Well, that's okay because you can just take a big blob of sauce and plop it back into your bowl and that's what will get all of those herbs or sugar that are stuck on your spoon off of your spoon. The last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna give it the garlic pow. We're gonna take and we're gonna add an eighth of a teaspoon of minced garlic. Now, whoa, that's really strong. Um, we're gonna take and scoop that out with my spoon on top of it. We only use an eighth of a teaspoon because we're making individual pizzas. And so that's all we really, really need. Um, if you were going to do like a big batch of pizza sauce, you would probably use like two to three cloves of crushed garlic in there. And if you really love garlic, put in more. There you go. All right, so I've got our sauce made and here it is ready to go. Um, let's see, oh hey, extra shout out. Hi Tawny, how are you today? I hope you're having a great day. Uh, Tara, happy birthday belated to Miss Tara um, is in there. All right, I'm gonna take and I'm gonna grab a spoonful of sauce and I'm gonna take and put it right in the center of one of my pizzas. So I'm gonna move this so you guys can see what's going on here a little bit easier. So I got my dough. And I'm gonna take a spoonful of sauce and put it right in the middle. And I'm gonna use the bottom part of my spoon and I'm gonna use that to kind of push the sauce toward the edges. So here in the Northern Midwest part of the country, we like what we call like kind of North Coast style pizza. And I think that's because we all grew up on frozen pizzas um, is my theory, where I like the sauce almost to the edge. Like I just need like that frozen pizza baby crust. If you like, if you like a big crust, keep it away from the edges. Um, but I like to push it just to the boundary. Um, and that's kind of what I like consider like North Coast pizza here in the Midwest. Here we go. All right. So now we're going to take and we're going to put this. And if you have the three kits and you're baking along at home, then you would divide your sauce, um, each of the little sauces onto each of the little pizzas that you would have ready to go. And then I'm going to use my knife again here and I'm going to lift the pizza up and I'm gonna get it onto the baking sheet before I put the toppings on. And that way I don't have to lift the pizza with all of the toppings on it because then your toppings go everywhere. All right, so I'm just gonna kind of wiggle this underneath and lift it up and put it onto the parchment paper. And I'm gonna re-spread it out a little bit on the parchment paper the way that I want it. So it's a nice on there. Now, do people have to use parchment paper if they don't? You didn't, use? no, great question. You do not need to use parchment paper if you don't wanna use parchment paper. I like parchment paper because I hate doing dishes. And parchment paper prevents that from happening. But you could also put, um, if you have cornmeal, a lot of places you can use a little cornmeal um, on the bottom and that kind of gives it that like extra little crust on the bottom of your pizza and helps them so they lift off of your pizza. Um, or just like, again, spray it with Pam, um, right, right on your pan. Pam on the pan. Okay, our toppings for this. So I'm just gonna use some shredded mozzarella cheese here. And in your kit, you got a package of cheese that was enough cheese for all three of your pizzas. So don't put them all on one because you won't have enough for everything else. And I'm just gonna take and I'm gonna sprinkle a third of that cheese on the pizza. And I'm gonna use my fingertips to just gently kind of move it around to all of the edges, all right? So there we go. And then the other thing that you received in your kit is a little package of pepperonis. And so if you love pepperonis, you can put pepperonis on there too um, and for you guys to use or whatever toppings that you want. The only thing I would say is if you're making this at home is to be mindful of like, don't supersize it, I guess. Too many toppings are gonna weigh down the pizza and so what you're gonna end up with is a crust that is completely cooked and the inside of your pizza is gonna be super, super gooey and not cooked all the way through. So. It's, it's be, be a little cautious with how much toppings you put on. I would say for each of these personal size pizzas, you do not want to put more than like, maybe like a, I would say probably like a third of a cup of toppings total. And that would include the cheese too on this. Cause this, you want the crust to cook all the way through when you're doing this here. Um, let's see here. All right, um, just kind of looking at the screen. It's hard to read and do this at the same time. All right, so we're gonna bake these off. And these take about eight to 12 minutes in your oven to bake and 
we like to bake the pizzas hot. And so you want the pizzas at about between 400 and 425 degrees. And then I always halfway between, so at about five minutes, I take and I rotate the pan in my oven because I know my oven at home has like that spot in the back right corner that just likes to cook everything a little bit more than all the other spots in the oven. And so by rotating this halfway through the cooking process, that is how you can prevent that from happening. So like one side isn't burnt, the other side is not cooked. All right, so when they come out of the oven, ta-da, they're gonna be nice and golden brown and cheesy. Now, if you like a golden brown top, you can actually stick these underneath the broiler once they're cooked. Like you want the, the crust to be golden brown, but then you stick them underneath the broiler for about a minute and that'll make the cheese really, really brown and bubbly on top of there. And so that is your delicious individual pizza. So there's a lot of different ways. These are kind of cooled now, so you can just eat them like the whole thing. You can cut them up into little tiny pieces. I call them Ninja Turtle size pieces because it's pizza, like little tiny Ninja Turtle size pieces. Um, or you can eat them and fold them up and eat them like this, um, taco style, taco pizzas. Uh, so lots of different fun things that you can play and have fun with that. Um, all of these projects, like I said, uh, you can make with that one time batch of dough. And then you've got the full recipes if you bought the kit so that each batch of dough with your recipe cards would make like a large pizza. It would make enough for eight servings of everything or six to eight servings of everything. And so this is um, everything that we've made today. We've got our cinnamon rolls, our pretzel bites, and our pizza. And so I just encourage you all to have a lot of fun. Be experimental with these things. There's a lot of fun things that you can do with this. You could make savory pizza cinnamon rolls where you take your sauce instead of the cinnamon and sugar and cheese and roll that up and then turn them into pizza rolls um, and do that too. So that's another really, really fun way. Um, hey, shout out to James who's watching. Shout out to Kara who's watching. Pretty Auntie Kara. Hey, what's up? All right. Um, this is going to all be available. This video is not just live. We're gonna have it so um, anybody who missed it can watch it here. And then shortly after this, I'm gonna post it on our YouTube channel, which we're kind of dedicating to these kits right now, which is just uh, YouTube type in Way Cool Cooking School. It will pop right up. Um, now, before we um, get too carried away here, um, I just wanna take a moment again to thank you guys so much. This is such a cool way um, and makes me feel so, so grateful that I get to share some of the stuff that I know about cooking with all of you. I hope that you all learned something today um, and had a blast. And now without further ado, Lynn promised it, and so we are going to show you, this is our Rockin' Ramen uh, baking kit, which is going to go live for order at um, 1 p.m. today, which is in about seven minutes, um, where you can email Lynn um, for an order, or you can give us a call here at the school for an order, which is 952-949-6799. We cannot ship these orders right now. Um, hopefully someday we'll figure that out so we can bring Rock and Robin to everybody. Um, and the kits are limited. Um, and so if you're interested in one, um, when the lines open up at one o'clock, please make sure that you call and let us know because we want to get one in your hands if you're interested. And here is our Rockin' Ramen kit. So we've got everything here that you need to make not only um, ramen, but we're gonna do an upgrade on our traditional ramen. We're gonna also do a cheesy ramen. Um, it's like the mac and cheese of ramen noodles. And then we're going to do a ramen inspired cupcake decorating kit. So we're even gonna bake the cupcakes for you and you get to have fun creating your own little ramen cupcake um, for you to share with someone that you like. And so we're gonna include a lot of uh, some of the, the fresh ingredients. Um, we're gonna include a lot of our dry ingredients. There might be some things that I need you to pick up and have at your house so that we can make that kit work. And then, um, Lynn, did you have anything else to offer about the kit? Um, the last thing I wanna say is when you send an email, if you could please make sure to include your phone number so we can reach back to you um, and process your kits faster. So again, the email address to order your kits is lynn at waycoolcookingschool.com. And just put your phone number, your address, um, your email, your contact name, and then we'll get right back to you and grab credit card information. Um, so that we can get your kits ready. And again, the kits will be ready on Tuesday. And the last time, the last order um, we're gonna take is on Sunday night at um, 
midnight. So um, please uh, order so we can get these out. It's going to be a lot of fun. And thanks again for watching Mary and us do these uh, cooking videos. We really appreciate it. And it's Friday. So have Yay. a way cool weekend, you guys. <laughs> yeah. All right. Peace out. Love you guys. Be safe. Be well. Take care of your families and have a great weekend.